what happens. Eli's son, the ark is captured in chapter 4, verse 18. Um, Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's two boys, are killed in battle. So the two sons of Eli are killed in battle, and a messenger gets up, and a messenger runs from Aphek all the way up to Shiloh, and Eli is an old man. He's not going into battle, and he's apparently heavy too. They come to Eli, and the messenger tells him this in chapter 4, verse 18. It says, the messenger says, comes, when he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and heavy and had led Israel 40 years. Was Eli really a bad person? I want to say Eli wasn't a bad person. He seems to be weak over his sons. His sons were doing some really bad stuff and he should have stopped them and he didn't. He led Israel for 40 years. His sons die? Is that a problem? His sons die, is that a problem? Should the father always die first before the kids? Is that the natural order? In other words, the father dies first. I faced this a year ago in this, in this very room, in this context and stuff. My son was in Afghanistan. And I gave him lecture after lecture to my son. And I told him, who dies first? And I told him, the old man dies first, right? So don't go getting any ideas, you know, about being some hero over there and stuff. I want you to come back alive. The old man goes first. That's me, okay, and not him. Because is there something really, how should I say, does it really, really hurt a parent when their child dies? You know what I'm saying? It's like the parent should die first. That's the way it should be. And, um, and we really struggle, to be honest with you, really, really struggle with that last year. He came back. Now he's back in America, and he's got all his limbs and stuff, many of his buddies. Many of his buddies did not come back like that. And many of them didn't come back at all. And, uh, well, they came back, but in a box. And worse than that. But anyway, so it just is, is interesting here. Eli hears about his sons. There's no big reaction. When he hears that the ark of God is, and he falls over backwards, so the father and the sons die in the same day. And so Eli now is what? Eli's off the scene. Who's going to take over now? Who's ready to take over? Eli's off the scene. His sons are all gone. Well, we got one little boy that we got to get in here first. Uh, this guy's name is Ichabod. As soon as I say Ichabod, what, what's the next word you think of? Ichabod? Crane. Yeah, everybody thinks of Ichabod. Ichabod. It turns out that Phineas, uh, Phineas' wife was pregnant when he went off to war. Uh, does this often happen where guys and you know, a girl gets pregnant, the guy goes off to war, guy gets killed, and now the kid has no parent? I mean, does that happen? like here in America, like now. Yes, okay. And uh, so Phineas goes off. Phineas is killed. The wife then is having a boy, but in, what happens is the mother dies too in the process of childbirth. And by the way, in the ancient world, did women die in childbirth? Was that fairly, I don't want to say it was super common, but it was fairly common in America now. You realize it's not a problem as much, but in the ancient world, a lot of women died in childbirth. And so she dies in childbirth, and as she's expiring and stuff, the nurse basically says, don't despair, you have given birth to a son. And she did not respond or pay any attention. She's dying. And she named the boy Ichabod. Ich kabod. Ich kabod. Ich means no. Ich means no. Kabod means no kabod. No glory. Okay? The glory is departed. And so she names this kind of the glory is departed. By the way, do you see that there's a kind of a double entendre meaning here as well? The glory is departed. Does she mean that her husband died in battle? Probably. Okay? That her husband died in battle. The glory is departed. By the way, has the glory departed in the sense that the ark has been lost to the Philistines? That God's glory has been removed? So it's kind of like a double play on things here. And the, the glory has been departed, meaning her husband's dead, but it also, the ark has been lost, and that's probably the more significant. When I was a young kid, I, was, I went to a real uh, conservative, fundamentalistic Baptist church. And have you ever been in a church where they uh, kick out the pastor and things? And it's, anyway, so they're in the process of kicking out this pastor, and it's getting pretty tense. And so the pastor then gets a sermon. He pulls everybody out of the church. There's like 300 people in the church, and all the people out on the street in the church and he stands in front of them and, and he basically says, they're going to write Ichabod over this church in 10 years. They're going to write Ichabod over this church. Now, what did he mean by that? The glory is departed. And he basically was saying the demise of this church, you kick me out, this whole church is going to fall because I am the great, you know. And it was probably good that they got rid of him. But anyways, 
But what I'm saying is, is that, is that really arrogant? They're going to write Ichabod over this church. I mean, you can just see the arrogance coming through. I mean, it's this, you know, whether the church was right or wrong, actually, I think they were probably right in doing what they did. But anyways, just that, that phrase, Ichabod, the glory is departed kind of thing. Um, now, what happens? The Philistines, the Philistines get the ark. What's the deal with the ark? Well, there's going to be a problem with the ark. And I want to introduce now, if I said the word pentopolis to you, this is Greek word, pentopolis. Penta means what? Five, like pentagon. Penta means five. Polis means what? Pentopolis. Polis means what? City. Okay, so you have a pentopolis are the five cities. And these are the five cities of the Philistines. And these are famous places. Even till this day, these are famous. If I point to this one here, Gaza, you've all heard of Gaza, the Gaza Strip down that Israel has so much, uh, there's so much embattlement with uh, Israel till this day. Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, Gaza, and Ekron. These are the five famous uh, Philistine cities. And what I want to do is just show you a map. By the way, can you, you guys download these maps on PowerPoint, right? So download the stuff so you don't have to kind of pay all that much, you know, to get it exactly right. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Joppa is where Tel Aviv is today. So this is Tel Aviv. Our first place is Ekron. The battle took place here at Aphek. This is where the Ark was captured. They came down here to Aphek. The Philistines captured the Ark. They took the Ark over this direction to the Philistine, five Philistine cities. Ekron is one city. Gath is next to it. By the way, you all know somebody by name from Gath. He was a real big guy. Goliath of Gath. The Goliath was from Gath, and that's where Goliath's hometown was. Okay, so Goliath of Gath, Ekron. These are the two. Notice that these are closer to Israel, toward the mountains. They're still on the plains, but they're closer to the mountains. These are here. Then there's three out on the coast. There's three out, two internal and three out on the coast. The first one is Ashdod. Ashdod is here. There's some sand going through here. And Ashkelon. Now, when you look where Ashkelon is, where is Ashkelon? Is it right on the coast? Ashkelon, right on the coast here? What's, what do you know about the Mediterranean Sea? Is the Mediterranean Sea, or really, if you go to Israel, is this where you want to go swimming? Ashkelon. Beautiful white beaches. The water is about 72 degrees. It's not like New England. You don't get used to the water. You don't have to get used to it. You walk in, and it's like perfect temperature. And the waves are you know, com coming in, and you can body surf and stuff. Beautiful sand beach and things. And by the way, this is also the Boston area, Ashkelon because Harvard University has excavated Philistine remains here for a ton of years, okay, with Stagger, some of the guys down at Harvard have excavated for a long period of time in Ashkelon, and that's Harvard, that's Boston, so it kind of makes you homesick. The only problem is Harvard, I think, that, I think my last recollections on Ashkelon was that Harvard bailed out of it, and I think some college east of, uh, or west of uh, Chicago picked it up, some school, I don't like to say their name, but it's just a, uh, it's kind of like Wheaton College, I think John Monson. Wheaton College is now uh, take, took over from Harvard and is excavating there at Ashkelon. So that's a really, if you, seriously, if you want a beautiful place on the coast to swim, the only thing is you've got to watch out for missiles from Gaza. But other than that, it's, uh, anyways, okay, that, that's a different story. Sorry, sorry. But anyways, Gaza, Gaza's down here. Do you see? So it's Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdown, three are on the coast. What comes right up through here? And why were the Philistines so brilliant for putting their cities along here? Because what's, what's coming up this road here? This road goes down to where? What's down here, south of there? Egypt. Is Egypt the breadbasket of the ancient world? Egypt is going to be sending all their goods up to Mesopotamia, right? They're going to be coming right up this road. When you've got cities on this road, question, does that mean money? Yeah, these, they're going to, in other words, people shift, ship things. Did any of you guys from New York? You got it in New York, you put a toll booth, right? Toll booth, you make money, okay? And so what they've got is toll booths coming up here, and they're going to make the Philistines, in other words, are the Philistines going to make a ton of money through trade, largely, because the, anything coming out of Egypt is going to come right up. This is called the Via Maris, or the Coastal Highway. This Coastal Highway, this is Route 95. This is Route 95, comes right up here, major road up into Mesopotamia. And so the Philistines are right on that. So they're going to benefit from all the stuff, all the trade going back and forth between Mesopotamia and Egypt. The Philistines cash in. 
So it's, it's pretty, they're in pretty good state. Uh, whenever I see Gaza, too, I, I remember I had a conversation with a Jewish fellow, and he told me to go to Gaza. And I was in Jerusalem, and I could never figure out why he told me to go to Gaza. He said, Lech Laaza. They, they, they don't say G, they go Ra. Lech Laaza. Go to Gaza. And I, I was trying to figure out, I told the guy, I don't want to go to Gaza. I'm in Jerusalem. Why, why, why would I want to go to Gaza and stuff? And so then I asked around, I said, it was really odd. The guy told me to go to Gaza, but what's that? Gaza is considered a really, really hot place. And the guy wasn't really telling me to go to physical Gaza. He was telling me to go to another place that's very, very hot. And so he was telling me, and I had no clue. I'm trying to understand. What's he mean by Gaza? I don't want to go to Gaza. <laughs> so he was telling me to go to, um, let me use another word like Sheol. I mean, like, uh, uh, he was telling me to go to an, an English would be a you know bad place, okay? And I, but they say Gaza to do that, okay? It's like a euphemism. You don't want to tell somebody to, where to go, so you tell them to go to Gaza. Uh, but it, does, does every language have like idioms like that? You know, what I'm saying that the people know what they mean. But if you're outside or you're, you're trying to figure out, well, what about the city of Gaza? You know, and stuff it has nothing to do with Gaza. The guy just told you to go to Sheol. Well, oh, anyways, okay, okay. Philistines in the Ark. So the Philistines capture the ark. This is in chapters uh, 4, 5, 6, thereabouts. And they bring the ark into their city, and they set the ark in front of this god Dagon. Okay, Dagon is believed to be, uh, he originally used to teach this as a fish god but because of the word, but that's not correct. It's probably more grain or fertility, uh, grain god or fertility god. But the god's made out of stone. They put the ark in front of this god. What happens to this god? Boom. God falls over, knocked him down. So what the people do, they come in and hear their God has fallen down, almost, you know, prostrate in front, of, in front of the ark. So they pick up their God again. You can see him putting some nails in the God's feet to make sure he stands up straight. So, you know, do you get the irony of a people having to set up their God? So he sets up their God. Then what happens? They come in the next day. What happens? The God has fallen over now, and it falls so hard, man, the head falls off, and the hands that were probably out like this, they get busted off. And so all you got is this torso of this God because the rock has been busted off, fallen down, kind of in front of God, almost in a worshipful position in front of the ark. And so what happens with the ark? Well, the ark, now there's other problems that come with the ark, okay, the plagues. And so wherever the ark is taken, people start dying from a plague. And the Philistines start dying from city to city. And so what they start doing is ship, shipping the ark, you know, UPS, UPS it from one city to the next. And then wherever it goes, man, people are dying and things. And so finally the Philistines say, we got to get rid of this ark, it's going to kill us. And so the Philistines, uh, basically, how are we going to return the ark? And so in chapter 6, verse 4, the Philistines asked, what guilt offerings should we send uh, to him? And they replied, five golden tumors, five golden rats, and up. Anyways, according to the number of, okay, according to the number of the Philistine rulers. In other words, five, why five golden tumors? Why five golden rats? There's five rulers of the five cities of the Pentapolis, and so they each chip in a golden rat and a golden tumor. By the way, do you also remember what they did with the calves? They took cows that had calves. They, put the, they hooked the calves up to the cart that was going to be pulling the ark. Normally, calves will do what? If you got the mother cows behind, where will the calves go? Will the calves go back to their mother? Yeah. And the Philistines said, we'll just see if this is really from God or not. If those calves go up the hill to Jerusalem, you know, up toward Jer Jerusalem, up toward the hills, to back to the Jews, then we'll know it's of God. But if the cart turns around, then we'll know it's no big deal. Guess what happens with those calves? Shoom, straight up to Beit Shemesh and right up uh, into, into Israel territory. And so then they, they sacrifice those uh, cow calves uh, to the Lord. But why the golden tumors and why the golden calves? Uh, golden tumors, and the golden rats. It, it's uh, believed that this is what's called sympathetic magic. Sympathetic magic. Um, people believe rats and tumors. Rats and tumors, what do you associate that with? Rats and tumors. Black yeah, bubonic plague, black plague. Okay, And so it's believed that they made models of the tumors that were killing them, and they figured out that it was done by rats, and so they, they, they make these models and send the models away. And if you send the models away, that means that the disease will go away. It's kind of like 
Do any of guys like read anything on voodoo where you take a doll and you stick a doll with needles and this doll represents this person and if you, you know, do something bad to the doll, it happens to the real person? Do you guys ever, that kind of thing? And so th I think this is the same thing. You know, send the five tumors away made out of gold and stuff, honoring their God and stuff, send the rats away and the disease will leave us. And so the ark does go away and the five Philistine cities is sympathetic magic kind of thing. Now,